um, you know, so you can apply now and reserve the room of your choice. Um, the CAS that is required in order to apply for the visa, we will begin processing those from the 1st of July. Um, that's for those students that have their unconditional offers. So if there are students from the college that as they get their results and we update their offers, we will be able to move forward with is issuing their CAS. Um, even though right now we don't know exactly when the visa processing centres in Nigeria will open. Um, we're currently reviewing the welcome programme for undergraduate students, um, especially those that are travelling from overseas, to make sure that if they do need to self-isolate for 14 days, um, if that regulation is still in place in September, but we expect that it will be, to can arrive earlier, how we can support them in meeting that. Um, and then what we expect to see, you know, from September is that classes will be delivered through a blended approach of both face-to-face -face and online. And what we are looking to do is to structure that in such a way that we did in the China campus, where if a student has any delays for any reason, that means they can't be on campus in September, they can start online and then join us um, as, as soon as they're able to. So um, the visa team will be contacting individual students and asking them when do they intend to come so that we can issue the CAS at the right time to make sure that that's a smooth process for them. Um, we also have some flexibility around English language. For most students coming from Nigeria, that's not a huge, huge um, issue. Most students have their WIAC English or an IGCSE English or a degree certificate from a Nigerian university that we can accept for entry to an undergraduate or a master's program. So there is some flexibility around that in case students don't hold those particular qualifications and they're looking at alternatives. And as I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a very dynamic situation. So we do have a dedicated portion of our website where we are making sure that all of the information is up to date. We keep a record of the messages that are going out, the updates that are sent to current students, the staff, all of that is there and is available for you know, prospective students to have a look and, and really understand how the situation is evolving. So that's all um, from me. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you want to see any more, I've put the website there on the, the screen and you can contact me through the Bridge House Counseling Unit as well. So I'll be very happy to take any questions later on. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for your presentation. So I will be calling on University of, oh, sorry, Love Bro University, Alicia. Can you let me unmute your mic so I can um, have you speak? Okay, up. thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, we're done. Thank you. Just give me one second. Okay, so uh, I hope now you can all see the screen okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you again. Just to echo um, what Emma said there, thank you very much for the opportunity to reach out to you because obviously um, with limited travel, it makes all the difference being able to just connect with you all today. So thank you for giving up a little bit of your time to hear more. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Loughborough University just to introduce us and we'll skip fairly quickly through some of the earlier slides um, because some of you already know us and try and get to the, the meat of the content, which is um, obviously the coronavirus um, information. This is what Loughborough used to look like, um, by the way. So this is us um, about 1930. It's a campus um, university. Um, for any students who think this doesn't look very exciting, don't worry, it's changed a lot since then. So this is what it looks like now. Um, and Loughborough is a campus institution in, in the Midlands, not too far from Nottingham, um, between the cities of Nottingham and Leicester. And that's, that's what we look like today. This is where we're located. We have about 22,000 students um, and Nigerian students make up the third largest nationality on campus. So um, we've been having students coming from Nigeria for about 70 years. Um, and obviously that, that means we have some strong links with the region. 
Um, <clears throat> this is me. So you, we have got Nigeria country pages on the website. Um, it does have a lot of information there, but if anybody did want to connect um, via one-to-one -one appointments, we can do that as well to discuss any concerns, especially any offer holders ahead of your time arriving to Loughborough. So I know some of you, we've already connected, but if anybody would like to, you've got my email address there or you can reach out through Bridge House. Just a quick overview of Loughborough. Um, we have been advised recently that we're now in the top six of all the UK um, league tables. So we're fourth, fifth and sixth in the, in the three major league tables. Um, in the bottom left icon on this screen, you can see that we're also very strong on sports. Uh, we've been the world's best sporting university for the last four years. Um, who knows what's going to happen with sport and that's going to be something that I'll talk about um, in a minute because obviously contact sports and football has been put on hold. Um, so it's something that we're, we're obviously watching very closely um, from the Loughborough side of things. In terms of employability, students will still have the option of placement years for all of their undergraduate degrees. Um, this year we obviously have students who are moving from their second year into what would have been their placement year and many students are asking how um, is the university going to be supporting them with doing this um, provided their employer is still offering them the post um, then the university is, is still in a position to support those students the only time that we've had any restrictions has been for a very small group of students who have opted to do their work placement in the USA and for various reasons, the universities um, decided that we, we would rather that they look for options, which maybe we were in the UK or in other countries as well. So for those students, we have tried to work with them to find alternative placements. At the end of the day, it is down to the student where they do their work placement. And if they would like to go to the USA still, and if travel is permitted by the time they're due to start, that's not a problem. Um, we'll still support them as necessary, but we have given advice that we'd prefer for the student to look at options closer to UK where we can um, retain that support of them more effectively. Um, most Loughborough students will look to do a work placement. It does bear a diploma or of professional studies or a diploma of industrial studies. So doing a work placement year, whichever university you go to, is a really highly valuable asset. It means you study for two years. Year three is a year in industry. Um, and then you come back for your final year and then you complete your degree. So you, you graduate with a good degree, work experience, and you also get a professional qualification. And also for many students, um, they do get a job offer from the company that they do their placement with. So we found about 40% of our placement students remain with the same company. But overall, about 98% of our graduates get a job within six months or continue into further study within six months, which is, is testimony to how they, they tend to perform on those placements. So we, we strongly advise students, if you're not sure, opt to do the placement first. It's easier to change your mind and decide that you're not going to do the placement than it is to get into your second year and think, actually, I would like to do one. Now you need to extend your visa. Now you need to make those preparations. So if you're at the stage of applying now or next year, um, we say make, make the placement an option and then you can always just not take it up if the time comes. We also have had the largest um, employers fair in the UK for the last few years. This is going to look quite different. We normally hold this in November and again in the springtime term. Um, so twice a year we have up to 200 employers, um, big names like Amazon, Goldman Sachs, GE, Rolls-Royce is actually based um, on the Loughborough campus in one portion, but this won't be the mayhem that you see in the picture in front of you for obvious reasons. So what we're likely to do now is that we will have perhaps a reduced number of key partners. So the top companies that Loughborough sends the highest volume of students to as graduates, they may still have a physical presence. If the weather allows for the spring term, then they're looking at holding this event potentially outdoors with marquee systems set up. Um, we're also looking at creating a one way system so that students won't be moving back and forth between employers. They'll just go through a flow system to you know, prevent students from crossing over with each other any more than is necessary. 
So something a little bit like this, but actually different employers in different virtual rooms where students can then um, sign up to interact with them. And the benefit of that is that employers can actually filter the students that they're talking to, to a higher degree. So if they know that they only want to meet with, say, um, chemical engineering students who are in their final year, they can filter for those students as well. Um, so we are working around that. The first event is not until November of this year. And by that time, we'll have a much better understanding of what things will look like um, going forward and what the government guidelines are. But of course, um, we do want to try and retain that event. And it's one of the strengths of, of getting students in front of employers um, to give them that exposure and to try and give them that platform. So we are going to work to retain that. In terms of student experience, um, we have about 7,000 rooms on campus for accommodation. The vast majority of those are for undergraduate students to use. And every room is a single occupancy room. So the students don't have a roommate. They don't have to share their personal space. Um, they will be single occupancy bedrooms. Um, and again, we're going to introduce one way systems into many of our halls of residence. So all of them, by definition, will have fire exits and we're going to transform some of those into an exit route. So rather than students trying to move past each other in hallways again, there'll be a through flow um, wherever possible. We're also going to be holding our open days and department open days in virtual events too. And we've held some of those already, but there are some more coming up. So there's actually one next Saturday on the 27th. Um, and if you recognize the presenter's voice, that's because it's me again, even though it's not an Africa presentation. Um, so students can engage more in terms of visiting the campus online. And we do have virtual tours as well, where students can um, click on the interactive map and it will take you around the campus to get a feel for it. And I do appreciate it's not the same as seeing it in person, um, but it's as close as we can get for now. Um, Loughborough is very fortunate. We've won um, Best Accommodation Awards uh, for four years um, and we've won events like University of the Year as well a few times. But I think one of the key things about Loughborough is obviously its sporting um, reputation and that's an area which is, is probably going to see quite a bit of change in terms of how we move forward. So one area that we're looking at is, is um, actually is twofold. First of all it's how our students who are involved in sport, how do they maintain that interaction with sport given the lockdown? Um, and secondly, what effect is that having on our students' mental health? Because you know, very often students will see sports as a release from their academic studies. It's something they're very passionate about and to have that taken away can sometimes have a huge impact on individuals, especially uh, younger people as well. So for Loughborough, we're looking at um, how we can open up the gym we have two gyms on campus and one idea that they're looking at at the moment, the facilities management um, team at Loughborough is looking at opening up the gym with um, areas where students would essentially work out in pods. So you have um, transparent screens around the workout area and then before using, using the gym equipment, it's wiped down and sanitized. And when somebody else comes again, it's sanitized again. So there are ways of working around this. We're also looking at back sports, um, such as rugby and reducing contact for that um, if students are just playing for fun. When it comes to professional level, I think it's a question for the industry on a much wider scale. And Loughborough is doing research into this area. It's one of the parts of the coronavirus pandemic that we're contributing to. But as yet, there's not any announcements for now. Um, in terms of the sport at Loughborough in general, um, as I mentioned before, we've been first globally for the last four years. We have four football pitches at Loughborough and we have four football teams. So the first two teams of the university are the students who generally are trying to get into professional level football. Um, that's what we call the, um, the professional level squad, the elite athletes. And then teams three and four are usually made up of very good players but people who perhaps are looking to development. So we call them the development squad where they are trying to get into the first and second teams. Um, and if Loughborough had been a country, then we would have finished 17th in the Olympics. So that's a little bit of detail about us as, as a sports uni. 
In terms of what we're doing for 2021 entry, um, we are involved, like I said, in sports. We're involved in digital technology development as well and transports specifically in terms of the fight against coronavirus. We have the advantage of 438 acres of campus. So the, the campus itself is very spread out. And we've been offering a lot of support to our existing students. So some of the things that we've done to take care of our students who are already with us have included things like releasing them early from their accommodation contract. If a student needed to return to their home country, then um, we've released them without charge. And we've also assisted them in negotiating a release with private landlords as well. And we've successfully helped quite a number of students with that. Um, we've been giving students who are stranded at Loughborough free evening meals. Um, for any students who had to self-isolate because they're not feeling well, we've also delivered food as well to them. And then they've had remote access of online learning. So learning has carried on, um, albeit in a slightly modified format, and we've given them online access to the library, which again was already there in some form already, but we've enhanced that and developed it too. So we've tried to keep things as stable as we can, and we've also tried to give students that reassurance that the university is continuing as, as normally as possible. In terms of meeting conditions, a lot will depend on the timing of when WIAC and schools get the results back to us. Um, we don't make unconditional offers at Loughborough, so we do need to see students submit some kind of final grade or official result um, from whichever board or from whichever school that might be. But we are being a little bit more flexible with English language. Again, as Emma said, it's not really an issue that tends to um, affect Nigerian students so much, but if somebody didn't have their English language qualification, we can now accept various online um, tests. In terms of what September will look like, we're working on the basis that September will start at the start of term as normal. That means the first day of studies technically will be the 5th of October. So students normally arrive at the very end of September they have an induction week, which will look a bit different from previous, um, but we will still run an induction week with campus tours, opening a bank account, collecting you from the airport free of charge. All of those things will still be in place. Um, and then when students start their learning, we, we already had an online platform, which is called Learn, and a system which is called Lecture Capture. And that means a little bit like we're doing now, an academic would talk the students through a series of webinar presentations and slides. And then there's an opportunity afterwards for a QA. and a um, The difference will be that we're not moving all teaching onto this online platform. We are still conducting face-to-face -face teaching. So this is nothing new in terms of the provision that we've had the whole time. Um, these lectures are also recorded. So if students miss something, then they can go back and they can revisit the lecture again. So when it says a, a mixture of online resources, what it means is um, the library, for example, all of our sources at the library are now being uploaded so students can access those remotely. They don't physically need to go and get a book necessarily. Um, we will also be offering lecture capture, but for the most part for undergraduate students, the option is still that they will have face-to-face -face learning, they will have seminar groups, um, we're looking at how we can space these around. So again, the facilities management firm um, on campus are currently looking at capacity for all of our um, halls of residence and making sure that students can sit as far apart as government guidelines in indicate at the time. And also creating a through flow again, so we don't have students walking past each other more than they need to. They'll still have access to labs. Um, but again, we're looking at extending lab hours. So rather than the labs being open from 10 until four, we might now have them open from seven until six. And that way we can spread students out throughout the day um, and make sure that everybody gets their access. So we're, we're looking to keep things as normal as we can. Um, and in terms of a quick summary of Loughborough costs, um, I know some of you will have questions about tuition and fees and how that will work. 25% scholarships re remain in place. Um, you don't need to apply separately throughout the year. Um, and again, accommodation is usually paid for in, in semester payments. So I hope that's been a quick um, introduction and been helpful. But if you do have more questions, I'm happy to take those at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia.
Thank you. So for anyone who would have questions, please you can send it via chat so we'll be able to read it out um, when the time comes. Um, now we have Mr. Arinze from University of Access to address and um, inform us about the new normal. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Arinze. You can unmute your mic. All right, I've done that. Um, I'm trying to get this up. I think I have. Um, first of all, let me say a big welcome to all the participants. I know parents are in there. So we're happy to have them. Um, like my colleague said, um, if it was back in the, in the old normal, I uh, would have been to Bridge House a couple of times again and again to see our lovely students. But hey, there's always an opportunity, there's always a silver lining in every situation, and that is what we we'll do best to um, take advantage of. Uh, for those who are not familiar with SX, um, we are who we are. One of the things we say to people is, um, particularly our lovely young students, we tell them, welcome home. Uh, we try to ensure that they don't miss them so much coming from Nigeria or anywhere in the world, first timers or those who have been over and over but now having to live alone. So we say welcome home to them and we make sure they don't miss every, a lot from their, from their houses. Um, as we all know, the weather can be the same in Nigeria, but hey, what is what is it about if you don't have a mixture of um, everything you want? Um, so this is what SX looks like. The nice parkland, nice buildings, everything on campus, accommodation, teaching, classes, lecture halls. Every, we are a campus-based university, so everything is in one place. We're not very far from London, and are by train, of course, from London to our main campus, which is Colchester campus, where every other student will be coming to. So who are we? This is who we are, a global community university of the year, as um, awarded by Times Higher Education in 2018. So we try to keep up that award. You know, we try to do everything possible to remember that and, and be the best we can at every time. Uh, so we also been awarded good teaching. Yes, some of the courses we teach, you can see on your screen. If, if your video is on, you can see me. Yes, this is, um, these are some of the courses we offer. Um, Point to note, which I know a lot of uh, Nigerian students are interested in, is um, we don't offer the mechanical engineering, the chemical engineering, and the medicine courses as well. But some of the other ones, particularly the ones that are highlighted in red, um, Nigerian students are usually very interested in some of these courses, and we offer them. Um, yeah, so look through and then have your choice. Um, for, the, for our campus, like I said, we've got three campuses, one for acting, of acting, the other one South End, basically postgraduate students. But then the main campus, which is in Colchester, where most of our undergraduate students are quartered, you have, um, we, we have on-campus accommodation, like I said earlier, excellent research and teaching facilities. Colchester is UK oldest recorded town. It's friendly, it's secure, it's a good environment. We all know sporting activities, we're looking at things, but then the shopping, the social facilities are there. And this is, this is basically in, in, in a jiffy what you can get. Now, this is the accommodation, what it looks like. Um, all the rooms are single rooms. So you have your space, the, you have your own space, but of course you have a shared kitchen, 
and the hallway. And like um, Alicia said, we also are looking at how to make everyone comfortable, sanitizing common places, which you wouldn't find too often. Um, our teaching is still going to be a little of face-to-face um, -face teaching, smaller group of students this time. I'll come back to that later on. But the general area will have them sanitized at all times. Now, for entry requirements into SS, this is important for all our Bridge House students and parents, they need to know. We always ask for B average. And of course, we, have, we give considerations to students who have us as their firm. Um, WIAC and IGCSE is fine if you have a credit in the English language course. Then for some courses, you, maths is essential. We would like your maths to be C or B level as well. So this is being specific. Now for, for your general results, once we have a B average from your bridge house, um, results where you're good to go for for essence now this is what our school fees looks like um tuition fees between 16860 and 18730 um again we're looking at how to cushion the effects on parents so we've instituted a 3500 pounds bridge house automatic scholarship so all bridge house students who meet our academic qualification have a, a, an unconditional offer into SX University will have 3,500 automatic scholarship as long as they have us as FEM by June 19th. Um, so, but, but before you start screaming, what of the rest of us that might want to switch? There is going to be a possible clearing scholarship. So this is something I will immediately send across to Beach House once that has been approved. Of course, a lot of things, some of these things were put in place before the lockdown, before the whole coronavirus cases. So we needed to look at them again. We need to look at the policies and, and look at what's best for our new young family members, the new year one students to do. Right, so what measures are we looking at? Of course, we've had, um, we have in place some uh, measures to protect the health and well-being of our students and staff. The ones that are currently there, we've got uh, some distancing measures and we're looking at um, how to improve on this. However, while we're doing that, we still do value and quality of a, and transformative nature of an SX education. So we still want to maintain every aspect of quality and value that you get ordinarily. So doing that, we have to develop contingency arrangements, manage any further impacts of COVID-19 for the academic year. The, I mean, the ones that you and your, your kids or the kids themselves, if they are here, will be joining shortly. Um, so that is it from me, really. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask your questions. We're here, the chat is there. And when I see any question on SX, I will answer. And of course, Eniola can always avail you my phone numbers. Feel free to give me a ring and then uh, let's talk SX or any concerns you have at all. Thank you. That's that from me, Eniola, if you can hear me. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rinze. Um, you did well. So um, we have the next university representative, that's Professor Peter from University of Dundee. Professor Peter, can you unmute your mic, please? Yeah, that's me unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. The floor is yours now. Thank you so much. Good. Let me share my screen.
Okay, you can still hear me? And Yola? Yes, I can. I can hear you. I can hear you. Bro. Excellent. Excellent. Sorry, just, just some issues in my computer. So good morning, everyone. It is a great, great pleasure to, to join this webinar this morning. Uh, as Aniola has said, my name is Professor Peter. I'm the University of Dundee's academic lead for Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I'm delighted to, to join you and tell you a bit about Dundee and indeed the preparations that we're putting in place to welcome all of our students uh, in September, in October uh, 2020. So Dundee, as many of you will know, is located in Scotland. It's currently the Good University Guide University of the Year for Student Experience. And a little bit about myself initially. You can see me there wearing my, my wig. Uh, I'm a professor of law. Uh, I'm a barrister uh, called to, to Gray's Inn in, in London uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, and I've been at Dundee for 14 years now. I specialize in a subject called private international law particularly disputes uh, concerning uh, family law issues and, and especially international family law disputes concerning children. Now, in my role as, as Africa lead, uh, I'm a regular visitor to, to Nigeria, and I'm very proud of the very strong connections that Dundee the city and the University of Dundee uh, have with Nigeria. Uh, many of you will have heard of Mary Slessor, who did such great work uh, over 100 years ago in, in Calabar. She is, is a, originally came from, from Dundee. And in our recent redevelopment of our waterfront, um, we re renamed the sort of the main square uh, at that part of town, Slesser Square. And so I always think of that being the, the real connection to the heart of, of, of our city between uh, Nigeria and Dundee. Now, our strength of connections uh, goes back throughout our existence. Dundee is, is over 100 years old. It became an independent institution in 1967. Uh, before that, it was part of the, the ancient University of St. Andrews. Now, over the time of our existence, we've educated many, many students from, from Nigeria. We have a very vibrant uh, alumni chapter based in Nigeria. Uh, and here is a, is a picture of me and some members of our uh, alumni chapter who facilitated a meeting uh, for, for myself with the, the Honourable Minister of uh, State for Science and Technology. This was back in January, the Honourable Mohammed Abdullahi. So in my role, I engage with, with uh, leading colleges such as Bridge House, but also universities uh, across the country and indeed with, with ministries. Um, our, our graduates, our alumni, they span all of the, the key subjects that, that we teach from, from medicine, engineering, law, but particularly in the energy sector and the oil and gas sector. We have a leading graduate school. This is the Emir Cafe. So our alumni have at the very highest levels of the public and private sector across Nigeria, particularly, as I said, in, in the energy and oil and gas sectors. Now, obviously, in the light of the, the COVID pandemic, uh, there are many changes, as my other colleagues uh, from the other universities who have presented before have, have mentioned. And at Dundee, like in the other institutions, we're putting in place many, many measures to make sure that all of our students, new students and returning students, have a very safe environment to return to. So lots of steps. We're going to be making masks available, make sure that we have hand sanitizers uh, put in place at all key strategic points. And indeed, as you've also heard, uh, have movement protocols to ensure that the people move in a, in a one direction and don't come close to, in close to contact with people. And everything will be done in accordance with the guidance provided by the, the Scottish Government. Now, in terms of arrival, uh, here we can see that the, uh, most of our students coming from Lagos, they will fly to London, or you could also fly to Paris uh, or, or Amsterdam, and then take a connecting flight, most often to Edinburgh Airport. Uh, and we will be making sure that our students are picked up from Edinburgh Airport and taken to Dundee safely. Now, in terms of accommodation, 
I know it's a very key issue for students leaving home for the first time uh, and for students who come for the cell still in force uh, in September, we'd be making that accommodation available for free. Uh, students will live in groups. Um, each student room is en suite, so that provides a particularly safe uh, environment. Now, we've made some key changes um, for next academic year. We have pushed back our start date uh, for teaching to the 5th of October, and we have our welcome week beginning uh, on the 26th of September. Uh, and I've got the, the, the web link there for all the, the most recent up-to-date uh, information, uh, and that's current, uh, constantly uh, revised as, as government guidance uh, changes. Now, in terms of our approach to learning for 2020-2021, next academic year, enormous amount of, of, of work is taking place on that uh, across the institution that uh, I'm also closely involved in. Now, as you've heard from other colleagues, we will be engaging in a sort of blended approach. The extent to which we, we uh, apply our blended approach will be determined by the way in which the, the government provides, we, we, uh, the regulations that the government has put in place uh, for next October. Uh, but at present, we are looking at having online lectures using our existing online platform, uh, Blackboard, that all our students have used for many, many years. And also, we will be having face-to-face -face small group teaching, all in a, a safe, socially distanced manner. And this will include lab work for students doing uh, scientific subjects or, or indeed engineering subjects. Now, what sort of environment is it in Dundee? Well, Dundee, the university, it is a city campus, um, very self-contained. Uh, we do have green spaces uh, on campus and then lots of green spaces close by. Um, here's a picture taken from the, the redeveloped uh, riverfront right beside Leicester Square. In the background, you can see the Victoria and Albert Museum, that's sort of the, the jewel in the crown of the redevelopment of, of Dundee. I've got a link there to the uh, complete university guide website that said that Dundee is the second safest city uh, for university students uh, in the UK. Here's a picture of the, the city centre campus. Uh, student accommodation for new undergraduates is right there in the middle. And it's only a five minute walk uh, to the shops, to the train station and to the riverfront. And so everything is provided for there for students. There are mosques close by. There are many, many churches of different uh, Christian denominations all close by as well. There, there's an African store uh, in town. So it, it's a, a very easy place to live and indeed a very easy place uh, to be a student. Uh, no need for taking buses. Uh, everything is within walking distance. Now, in terms of tuition fees, obviously it's very, very important for classroom-based courses uh, for, for next year. Uh, it is £18,150 and for lab-based courses, £21,950. But we also have very, very generous scholarship packages. Uh, we have our automatic Global Excellence Scholarships uh, of £5,000 for each year study, so potentially up to £25,000 for students uh, doing architecture automatic if you get two A's and a B at A level, uh, three B's or above, uh, you get £2,000 a year. In addition to those automatic scholarships, we also have our global citizenship scholarships uh, and they mirror the financial awards, 5000 or £2,000 for each year of study and those are awarded after interview. And I know I've interviewed many uh, students from Bridge House College in my last visit in January and many were successful in obtaining the £5,000 scholarships. And that's based, the, the interview criteria are based on the Dundee values of valuing people, working together, integrity, making a difference, and excellent, excellence. And I am available in the next weeks to undertake more online interviews if anybody wishes to be considered. Now, before I finish, the uh, best way to know about Dundee is to hear from some of our students from Nigeria. So I've got a very short video of our African Caribbean society.
So thank you very much for, for listening. I look forward to joining my other colleagues now and to answering any questions you have about coming to study in the UK at next academic session. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Peter. Um, one of the questions for you, they would like to see your face again. So I understand you post your video to allow the oh. network properly. So they like to see a face to the handsome man speaking. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is me without my wig, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, I would um, unmute our speaker's mic so they can. I would read out some questions that have been passed across. So, Mr. Rinze, you can unmute your mic. Emma, please unmute your mic. Because I want to. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I have a question that relates to racism. Um, let me call it up. Okay, uh, let me please hold on a minute for me to expand the message for proper reading. Okay, this got my interest and I would like our speakers to actually talk about it. So racism, uh oh, it's gone again, okay. Racism, particularly against Africans, has been around for so long. What have you done over the years and currently to mitigate this and ensure Africans are freely accommodated, accepted in the society to pursue their studies? Let me just flip the coin and pass it to first Mr. Arinze. Can you talk about that? Then I'll open up other speakers as well. Well, it's it's good you, you asked me to start first so that it doesn't look like we want to throw people under the bus. Absolutely. Uh, being, African, <laughs> being, <laughs> being African myself, um, as you know, I've, I've been with Essex for, for close to 15 years now and working for University of Essex. So, um, I know the first shout will probably be, oh, well, you're one of the lucky few. <laughs> but but I, I appreciate the concerns people have. I appreciate um, uh, the, what, what people are worried about. However, in fairness to the universities, um, not just their sex, I think most of the UK universities are so global in nature. So people are looked after. I mean, you don't have where staff and students are all, all, let me say, British. So you have people from all over the world. One of my slides says Essex is a global community. And in fairness to most um, UK universities, you have a lot, a lot of people coming from all over the world, you know, study there. Yes, the concerns are usually what happens to these students. How do we stop? individuals. Let's not forget that some people will still be who they are, but the issue of institutional racism, it's something that over time these universities, the system has tried to, you know, do away with. But then you you never stop trying. Some individuals will have their 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 personalities will come out the wrong way, but as an institution, we try to make sure that these things don't go out of hand. And for Essex, for instance, you don't have reported cases. That is why most times I'm so, I'm glad, I'm happy. So the issues where you have students go to report that, oh, this lecturer is not doing this to me because of my skin color and all of that, those things don't happen. And trust me, even if it happens, there is strong mechanism in place in most of these universities to tackle that. I mean, I'll let, I'll, 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 I'll like Peter to come in and uh, okay. share some views. I mean, being a lawyer, there, there's probably some things he might have encountered. Okay, good, good. Thank you. 
the button has been passed to Professor Peter. So can you run the race with the question? Thank you so much. This is such an important question. It's always been an important question and it's even more important these days. It is a question uh, that, that I'm regularly asked and have been asked over the last few years in particular. Um, in respect of, of Dundee, um, Dundee has been the home to, to hundreds, thousands of African students over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and I myself, my, my interest in, in, uh, in Nigeria has come from the fact that so many of my students, my master's students, uh, when I joined uh, Dundee 14 years ago, were from Nigeria. And so that led me making my first trip uh, to Lagos and to Abuja in 2010. Now, over the course of, of teaching so many Nigerian students, I've not had any uh, complaint to me about racism. And one of the reasons that I like Dundee so much is that I find it to be a very friendly, inclusive place. Um, we're a small city. Uh, as I showed in, in, in my slides, we're the Complete University Guide survey showed the second safest city in the university city in the UK. Um, that's not to say that there cannot be isolated incidents, um, but we do have four uh, for our uh, students uh, focus groups. We have a focus group within my school, the School of Social Sciences, where they can raise concerns. Students have advisors of studies at Dundee and I imagine all the other universities represented as well. So there are many ways in which uh, students, if something unfortunately does happen, they can raise it either with an academic member of staff or with a, a member of support services. All the universities have, have international centers, uh, have student advice groups. Um, so if something happens, the most important issue is not to stay silent, it is to raise it and universities across the UK are fully aware of how important this is, this issue is, and to make sure that all our students from wherever they come from uh, feel uh, respected, uh, feel that they, they are being heard, uh, and we will do everything uh, that we can in our powers to make sure that students have the best possible experience whilst they're at a UK university. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, should we hear from, who would you pass the button to, to also um, make a comment about this question? Because Arinze- no, Let me pass it to Emma, Emma since she's living in, in, in Africa. Okay, good. <laughs> has a fruit in both camps. Okay, good. All right. Thank, thank, thank you, Peter. And th thank you for the question. I think um, it, it's a very topical um, issue of discussion, but it isn't a topical concern of the university, if I can put it that way. Um, so for those who um, didn't know, I'm, I'm based here in Accra. I manage our liaison office for West Africa. And I think that gives you an insight into the fact that we do have quite a large um, black student population. Um, but we also have a very diverse um, staff body as well. So something that has been ongoing is that there's a network of um, black members of staff. So whether they're academic, administrative, and one thing that has been going on within the university is a process of reverse mentoring. So the idea is that senior um, staff members, including the vice chancellor, have received reverse mentoring from junior staff members from black and minority ethnic backgrounds in order to allow them to see kind of their perspectives, you know, in terms of what it's like, whether it's to be a student, whether it's like to be a younger member of staff who isn't white. So this is something that the university has been working on for a long time to make sure that the issues of equality, diversity, um, that it's an inclusive space um, and we actually have a number of different student societies as the Ghanaian Student Society, Nigerian Student Society, you have the network of black medical students and they also have their own network and, um, and they have you know, publicly spoken out to you know, the, the university leadership and say, you know, can we do more? Can we make sure that there are more resources for Black History Month? Um, can we have clearer um, for, uh, for discussion around this? So there is a push kind of at all levels from the vice chancellor all the way down to students to make sure that this is an active topic of debate. And what the university has now done is also 
not just kind of say how do we deal with these but how do we ensure that we have a student population a staff population that is working to be anti-racist as well so there's lots of um, resources that have been added to the library um, students are being encouraged to do their own kind of education books that wouldn't normally have perhaps been in the university library because they're not taught as academic texts are being added so that students can also access those um, online. So it's something that is um, a big concern. And in the current circumstances, we've also had students who have been able to access extenuating circumstances for any assessments that they've had over the last month, because it's been a very um, difficult few weeks. Um, there's been so much going on in the world. Students have said, you know, this is something that is affecting you know, my ability to concentrate, it's affecting my mental health, it's affecting my ability to, to perform. So it's a, um, a short term kind of measure right now, especially with COVID, um, there have been some kind of allowances made as well so that students that are struggling to perform in the current environment are able to have some, some extra time. I think Loughborough maybe has had a similar response as well. I was, I was seeing in the news that Nottingham isn't the only university to have taken that approach so we have students from all around the world we have staff from all around the world and um, what our students tell us is that they come and they feel at home they don't feel like they need to justify their presence at the university no one's saying you know why are you here this isn't um, somewhere that you should be it's it's very open it's very welcoming and um, we look forward to you know making sure that it is and um, ever more diverse and an open space as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Um, Alicia, I think um, Emma mentioned you, so <laughs> in one I'm way. The last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. I think um, Emma touched on something really important then. It's, um, it may not be a case that people have a, what we describe as overtly racist attitudes where they'll say why are you here or why are you studying here um sometimes it wasn't a particular case that was fed back but it was something i heard on the british news the other the other morning where a school child described what we what we in the uk would call microaggressions which are um basically born out of ignorance um the example that she gave was somebody asking whether they could touch her hair and she didn't want them to. So I think there is some element of ignorance on, on the part of some people, which may not be aggressively intended, but it does still come out. And in that sense, the job of the universities is to try and educate and move people on um, across the entire board, cr across the entire platform. And that includes our, our current students who would hope by the age of 18 and 19 that they're not in this mind frame still. But there may still be some unintentional um, microaggression stances. Um, in terms of Loughborough and, and international students, we've had Nigerians for about 70 years coming to Loughborough, which is um, you know, a strong established group. But we also try to prepare students to expect you will be in a minority um, when you come to Loughborough. The vast majority of our students are white British. Um, but we also have black British students as well. So just because somebody um, is from an ethnic minority doesn't necessarily imply that they are an overseas student. There is a mixture of British students from different backgrounds. But that being the case, the university still has a very strong stance. There's a zero tolerance policy when it comes to racism. And most British universities, I'm sure, would have exactly the same um, position on it. The, that relies on students, I think it was Arinze who, who said, that relies on students having the platform to actually voice those concerns and to feed those things back. And that in itself can be a challenge. So one thing we're trying to do is provide as many platforms as we can for students to feel comfortable in feeding those things back, even if it's hard to put their finger on what it was that wasn't acceptable to them, such as a microaggression. Um, so we have things like Nigerian society, Ghanaian society, there's a welfare officer in the student union, just like there is for many um, British universities. Um, they will also have the international office. So this is somebody where they've met us before and we already have that personal link. Um, and it might be easier, therefore, just to um, feed some of that back directly to, to the person that you know. And then there's also um, BAME representatives as well within the university. 
and those usually are maybe a PhD student who's an African student or a lecturer who's become a lecturer but was a student previously um, and that way you've got some representatives internally and it's about unfortunately it's about changing mindsets um, and, and getting to grips with it. That said at Loughborough it's a market town um, we haven't had any sort of feedback in terms of, of racist um, incidents in town probably because the students are the lifeblood of the town itself. So the local people are quite happy to see the students. Um, I think if there is any risk, then it's, as I said, it's probably due to the, those micro incidents that I describe. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you, thank you, Alicia. Um, let me quickly ask you um, one question since you're on now. Um, someone wants to know mm -hmm. the difference between BNG and MNG. So please, can you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a fairly um, straightforward one. So BNG is the Bachelor of Engineering. MNG program is a Master's of Engineering. So a Master's of Engineering program typically has slightly higher entry criteria. It's because you'll be studying to master's level for that degree. It will take an additional year to complete. Um, and normally it's for students who know that they want to stay in that engineering discipline. If you're sitting between two disciplines and you think maybe civil or mechanical you might be better doing the bachelor of engineering and then when you come to your master's year you can then just take a master's um, in the subject that you didn't cover yet if that's what you want to do but both qualifications will allow you the same level because they're both master's level okay okay thank you um i have other questions for everyone here um the question goes this way. What is the plan for prospective students who are who have conditional or are conditional offer holders who have not made sorry, who have not been able to make to do their WIAC exams because of the COVID challenge? Are universities working out other ways of assessing the candidates to ensure that they join the September resumption? plans for universities so um can we have um emma can you please talk about that okay no problem um so typically a student that has done their WIAC or is due to sit their WIAC would be progressing into a foundation program um so whether they do that foundation program with us or whether they do it at, let's say, Bridge House or they you know, progress to their A-levels, um, they would always be able to then progress into the degree program. So our foundation programs that are managed um, by Kaplan that have progression into science, law and the business um, school as well, um, for those, what Kaplan are currently doing is they're accepting transcripts for um, all of SHS and they'll be looking at whether they can make um, an offer based on, on those particular results. Um, for the foundation program, I think there's still some discussion around um, how that would, would work, but I know that for the law and um, social sciences and also the science foundation, there is a possibility to have your ongoing record be assessed. So I, I'll pass over to the others if there's anybody that has a different. Okay, approach. okay, thank you, Emma. Mr. Rinze, please, can you um, advise what the school, what your uni is currently doing regarding those who haven't um, gotten their WIAC result? As we all know, the exam, the exams for WIAC isn't students don't know when they would write the exam. So what is in place for um, University of Access towards that? Mr. Rinze, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm here. I think I muted myself, uh, but uh, okay. I think um, you can hear me now. Yeah, like yeah. Emma yeah. said, um, for those who have not written their work, um, Kaplan is looking at it. Um, also, we are our foundations are run by Kaplan. Then for those who have been, you know, probably studied in Bridge House, maybe are waiting a particular 
you know, subject, English, math, something like that. Um, the departments are still looking into that. I mean, to be honest with you, there has to be a solution somehow because everybody knows where we are. I mean, it's not the student's fault, it's nobody's fault, not the institutions as well. However, what you need to know is whatever decision we'll take, we also have to do that in, con well, slightly in conjunction with the home office. For instance, if there is a requirement for English and some schools need to show that, is it that you show your own testing, in-house testing, or you find a way of accepting a particular kind of English? For the postgraduate students, I think that's been sorted, but for the undergraduates, it's a little bit um, still on, uh, you know, on, the, on the table for discussion. So I'm sure that in the coming days, that is still, um, you know, we have that on the front burner. In the coming days, that will be sorted, and the information will go out there well ahead of time so that we all know that we're in the same place, having the same, but the discussion is ongoing. The discussion is ongoing, I assure you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Renze. Uh, Prof, can you put your words to this? Uh, yeah, yes, no, no, no difference to the, to the other colleagues. That the, the only difference is that our foundation provider is Oxford International. Uh, and uh, if anybody has, has a specific case, I, I can present it to our co colleagues in Oxford International who, who can advise further. But, but yes, we are seeking to be flexible, as are they. Okay, thank you. So um, we have a question to Emma. We have a parent who has two children and they noticed there are no incentives from your school. So they need to know what incentives would you offer? And also they want to be clear about the pickup from the airport, the isolation and the location. So um, can you, would you be able to address that, Emma? No, no problem. Um... So as, as they've mentioned, we don't currently have a system in place where if there are siblings that there's a discount. So unfortunately, there's no good news that I can give on that. Um, in terms of the practical setup, um, as I mentioned, normally we would expect international students to arrive um, maybe four or five days before the um, official start of term. So that's time to arrive, um, get a head start with your registration, get a head start with um, the process of opening a bank account, and you can move into your accommodation earlier than the home students. So what we're currently looking at now is how can we advance that so that maybe students can arrive maybe earlier still than the home students, um, we don't yet know whether that will be a, a full two weeks ahead of the start of term or whether, you know, it will be to kind of minimise the amount of time spent in um, kind of isolation after the start date. So that's something that we're hoping to confirm over the next few weeks. Um, in terms of the airport pickup, normally we have um, members of our staff and student ambassadors at um, university, at um, Heathrow Airport on set days that would co coincide with the beginning of that international welcome program. So outside of those dates, we normally have a partnership with um, National Express. So I think once we've concluded the plans for the arrival date, we'll then also make sure that we have staff um, available to kind of guide students from those airports. What we know currently is that if you're traveling to the UK, you have to be able to give an address of where you will be staying for the first two weeks um, as part of the entry criteria to enter the United Kingdom. So we will be making sure that students are able to provide an address that means that they can come and that they will be able to successfully self-isolate. So um, I think once, once we've clarified the exact um, arrangements for that, we will communicate you know which airports, which dates we will have people to pick um, students up. Um, we're just an hour's drive from from Birmingham, so sometimes I do recommend that students look at flying into Birmingham because it's not too far. If necessary, you can hire um, cab that would take 
just due from the airport to Nottingham and it's not going to, to break the bank as well. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Um, a follow-up question to that is, how many installments is the tuition fee payable? Still for Nottingham? Yes, for you, Nottingham. Or for everybody? For you. Okay. So, so for Nottingham, if you... That's great. Um, so for the undergraduate um, students coming in for bachelor programs, there's no deposit requirements prior to the visa application. Um, and then we have three installment dates, uh, which are in October, January, and April. And so for international students, those are spread equally across the three dates. Um, obviously, if you do make a deposit payment prior to the visa or prior to arrival, um, that would be taken against the October deposit. But there's no um, compulsory requirement. It may just be that you choose to do so in terms of the financial requirements for the visa application. If you're not able to hold the full amount for the 28 um, required days, um, so that's something that, again, the, the visa counselling team can advise on if necessary. Thank you, Emma. So, um, Alicia, can you also answer, put a word to that? Do you have um, instrumental plans for tuition fee payments? Yeah, sure. Um, so for Loughborough, the, the payment plan is usually in three installments and it starts after the student has arrived. So it'll be November, January and then late May. Um, for accommodation, students would pay per semester. So they, they book their room with a room bond and then they pay for semester one again after they've arrived. And then for semester two, we would invoice them again and they pay for semester two for accommodation. OK, thank you. Prof. Can you also tell us what instrumental plans you have in place for international fees? Okay, thank you very much. So we, we require a deposit to be paid up front. Of 1,000 student drives, we allow for seven equal uh, monthly payments uh, by installment. And that's both Sorry, for Prof. the Sorry, Prof. Fee. Can you please come again? Can you start again? You had, there was an interference. So please start. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So go, going back to the beginning. So to get the CAS, uh, we require a deposit to be paid of 1,000 pounds. Then as regards the, the residue of the, the fee, that can be paid by installment. And we accept seven installments uh, over the first seven months of the, uh, of the, the academic year. And we also accept uh, seven installments for payment of university accommodation. And university accommodation, to, to, to book that, it, it's a £300 deposit, and then seven installments thereafter, once you arrive. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rinze, can you put your words on that as well? Instrumental plans for payment of tuition? Um, yes, um, for, for University of Essex, we don't ask for deposits. Um, we, you can make a an installment of payments, three installments. However, like you know, I always do, and I mean, irrespective of the university the student is going to, I always advise Nigerian parents to push in as much as you can. You know, it's, it gives some sort of, um, it helps you, you know, to relax a bit and, and see what you can do while you mop up funds where necessary. It's, it's it also, it also helps, yes, the students don't usually bother, but some of them who bother about fees might be a bit distracted. So as much as we can on our parents, it's always advisable we're pushing that for what it's worth and then work with the universities for the balance. That's, that's what I usually will advise. So regardless of whether an university asks for deposit or not, if you can, remember it also has a knockout uh, you know, knock on effect on the amount of money required to be deposited for visa. So whichever, at whatever point you can, I will advise you do, you do that to make the deposit you can. Really. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, just to add in now, in regards, irrespective of the instrumental payments, for visa, you are required to show 
that you you have the funds for the full fees and the living expense so if you've paid one third of the installment to the university you're required to have two thirds plus your living expense in your account for a minimum of 28 days before you apply for visa so you still need to have the full amount somewhere but if you want to go with the instrumental plans that should be after you've procured your visa then you can arrange all the instrumental plans with the university i just answered one question asked by a parent so um let me let me check for so many questions are here please would um be patient with us because you guys need to answer our questions there is a question here Please, during the isolation, how will student get access to meals? During the isolation period, how will students get access to their meals? I think the person wants to know if they've secured accommodation and they need to isolate, if they have a self-catered or maybe the catering option of the of the accommodation will they have access to meals mr rinze can you well for as far as x there's a there's a plan for for meals to be delivered of course you have someone needs to pick up the phone because of you know the time i want to eat might not be the time you want to eat and then the things you want may not be the things I want. So somebody needs to pick up the phone and intercom, ring the estates or ring um, the the providers to be able to send food across. Yes, there's always the provision for that. Like I said, in essence, we have on-campus um, provision for meals for students. So that's that's that is not a problem at all. And I I guess that will virtually be seen. But I'll let my colleagues answer for 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 the universities. But I guess that will practically very much be the same. There's there's always provision for these kind of things. Yes. Okay, Emma, can you put a word to that? Um. Yeah. Sure. So um, the typical arrangement, you know, was that students can choose either catered where they have three meals a day, you know, or self-catered. The um, health and safety office are working together with catering and accommodation to be able to um, come up with a plan such that, you know, if somebody is required to self-isolate, they will be able to safely have access to, to meals. Um, what we expect will be, you know, is that there'll be a, a form of delivery service, but it may also be um that with social kind of distancing measures in mind if you're in a a self-catered flat it might be that you have some sort of timetable where if everybody in the flat is is self-isolating that you you take it in turns in order to access your kitchen and things like that so the exact kind of um plans for that haven't been published as yet but it's something that my colleagues are working very hard on you know they're looking at the capacity of the kitchens if they need to also um, cater for students that are not in the catered accommodation you know how they can um, meet up with all of that and what guarantees they'll be able to give so it's something that we're working very hard on um, behind the scenes to make sure that logistically we can meet every student's needs okay thank you let me let me just um speak on some other uh, questions yeah so parents wants to find out to all universities present here, if they pay full tuition upfront, will there be a sort of discount to full payment? Love bro, can you please talk about that? If a parent pays in full, would you yeah. consider a discount for early payment? Um. Okay, and unfortunately, Loughborough's response is going to be relatively short. We, we don't have an early bird discount, unfortunately, for parents where they pay the full amount. Okay. Um, so it's it wouldn't be something we offer. We do have the standard scholarship, but if a student's firmly accepted their offer, they would get that no matter how they pay their fee. Good. Thank you. Prof, can you talk about that? 
Yeah, yes, sort of like, like, like Loughborough, we, we do not have an early bird uh, discount either. We simply have the, the scholarships that I mentioned in my presentation, okay. the Global Citizenship Scholarship of uh, up to £5,000 for each year of study, for which I'm available to do interviews for. That, that's, the, that's our option. Thank you. XX -X Arinza, please can you put a word? Mr. Rinze. Okay. Um, Hi, sorry, I forgot. I forgot my, my mic. Um, sorry okay. about that. Um, I you got to come on. Yeah, you come on now. Um, yeah, so for, for SX, is a 3,500 pounds automatic scholarship for everyone we've admitted in SX, you know, in okay, terms good. and conditions. Irrespective so, of the irrespective, amount. Yeah. So even if you pay full tuition, so you'd you deduct that, you know, from from your end before you make the payment, and they will recognize that when we're sending the cars. Okay. I think that's what we plan to do. Yes. So take for instance, if your tuition is about fifteen thousand pounds, so any parent who wants to pay in full can remove the three thousand five from it <laughs> and send exactly uh, eleven thousand five hundred to you. Exactly. Beautiful. Exactly. So that that becomes a full payment. Yes. Okay, so this is a question from a parent. We moved to Nigeria from the UK four years ago in September. My son will be, will my son be an international student? Um, can Emma, can you, okay, can Emma, please, can you put a word to that? Let me read the question again if you didn't get it right. This is the question. We moved to Nigeria from the UK four years ago in September. Will my son be an international student? I want to believe mm -hmm. that probably the child, I think there should be some follow-up questions to this, but let me hear you speak. Yeah, um, so I think when, when the, the parent asking the question says we, um, if I take that as the entire family, so um, the students and both parents are in Nigeria, um, that would mean that they have all been outside of the UK for the last four years. So at that point in time, they would be considered as an international student. Um, the, the guidelines for this are published by um, UK CISA, UK CISA. So, um, they have very clear kind of um, guidelines around who um, qualifies as a home um, student. And universities must take a student as a home student if they um, qualify to be a home student. So, um, so it's to say that, you know, if you do qualify, then you will benefit from that. But the, the requirements are laid out. If the we is one of the parents and the student that is in Nigeria, but the other parent is still resident in the UK, is working there, has an address um, where you have your property, you're paying your council tax, that property you know, is not rented out to anybody else. And actually one of the parents is resident in the UK. At that point, the student would then qualify through that UK um, resident parent. So it's not a simple yes or no. I think we would have to look at the circumstances of the family in question before um, that is that is clarified. And so um, I think the the I'll I'll put the website into the the chat where people can look at the rules and regulations that universities refer to in um, clarifying the fee status. Okay, thank you. As a follow up to that. Um, the, the child was born in the UK. So usually what I know what universities do is, having sent the application, universities will send a fee status questionnaire to the right. parents or to the applicant to answer some questions. And based on that, all universities will make their decision to know if the student is eligible for an home fee status or to be an international students. Permit me to say I, I'm correct if I'm wrong. <laughs> Am I correct on that? 
Emma? Yes, that's, yes, yes, yes that's are. correct. Yes, you okay. Are. Yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, so that's fine. Um, another follow-up question, Emma, they asked again, do you give full, do you give discounts for full payments? Because I don't think they heard okay. you on that. That's right, yes. So, so there are two things I haven't responded to that everybody else had done. Um, oh, yeah. In terms of discount for full payment, um, we don't um, offer discount for full payment, but I should point out that our fee levels are fixed for the whole time that you are registered. So there's no increment between year one and year two and year three. So the fee that you pay in year one, that amount will stay the same in year two and in year three. Um, and then on the installments as well, I didn't add that for accommodation, we would typically have um, free payments for accommodation, but you can request a monthly payment plan as well. So it's available on request. Okay. okay. So thank you. Um, this goes to everybody. A parent is asking, I don't want to answer it, so I need you people to answer it. The parent is asking, can school fees, pocket money, and accommodation all be channeled through the university? Mr. Rinzig. I'm afraid for Essex, no. Thank <laughs> no. You. And I guess that will be the same answer for all the uni students. Let's let, let them, <laughs> Prof, Prof, please can you put a word to that? Can all the uh, pocket money accommodation school fees be channeled through the university? Yeah. Uh, no, not, not pocket money, no. Good, good. Alicia? Um, thing. No, no it, it will be the same, I believe, for all universities because, um, it, you know, any funds would have to, if they're paying paid out, they'd have to be paid back to the source that they came from, not to a third party. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. it will be the same for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah. And it's the same for Nottingham as well. Yeah. So you, you can pay the fees, you can pay the accommodation, but anything that is for the student to spend at their own discretion must be made available directly to um, the students. We, we can't channel those funds. Okay, okay. So um, I think a, a question here for you, Nottingham. Um, to get the cars, do you need to make any payments for deposits? So if you are coming for a bachelor's program, an undergraduate program, there is no CAS requirement. Um, if you're coming for a foundation program, then there's a CAS, there's a CAS deposit requirement that Kaplan um, would communicate as they manage the admissions for that. And then there is a CAS deposit required for master's program. I think the majority of those on this call are interested in the undergraduate program, the bachelor's. And so for that, there's no cash deposit. Okay. Um, Alicia, can you answer that as well? Do you need to pay any deposit to get cash? Yeah, it's the same for Loughborough as it is for Nottingham. So we, as an undergraduate, there's no deposit required um, for post-grads. There is. Um, but again, most people here, I think, will probably be undergraduates. If there are any postgraduates, we can have a chat about the, the deposit amount, and it's also on the website as well. Okay. I think you'll need a deposit for class. Um, Dundee? Yes, as I mentioned before, yeah, yes, a £1,000 deposit for the cast. Okay. And um, Nottingham, I'm sorry, Excess, do you need a cast deposit? No, no, not at all. Not at all. But like you mentioned about having to keep the amount of money required in your account for visa purposes. Yeah, yeah. Those are all the important factors at Thank the end of the day. Yes. Thank you. I hope I have not missed any question here. Please, in case I have not, to everyone, in case I have not answered your or raised your question, please, can you send it to me again so I can get it? Okay, I think I've seen one here. My question is, are universities are uh, your admissions to the university strictly by age? And what is the age requirement for entry? Uh, well, I think this question should be to Bridge House, maybe. Well, for, well, okay, let me just say, for most universities, 
they will accept 18. However, if you're less than 18, the uh, parental consent forms to be completed that would um, allow the universities to admit you. If that is correct, please can I just get a confirmation from our universities here? Right. Emma? So our, our, our minimum age um, in order to issue you with a CAS um, is 16. Um, and I think, again, this is a conversation that each family would need to make, you know, and bear in mind that the majority of the student population are 18 and above. So if, if you are happy to sign that parental consent form that the university can treat your 16 or 17 year old child okay. in the same manner as they're treating all of the 18 year olds, you know, then, then that's something that you can make that decision and sign the consent form. But we wouldn't accept any international students younger than 16. Okay. If I can say the position for Dundee. Yep, sure. So D D Dundee, it would also be 16. But the one difference between Dundee and the other universities here uh, represented is that in Scotland, <clears throat> students traditionally go and still do go to, to university when they are 17. So that the local students will be one year uh, younger than they would be in England normally. Um, my advice, though, to to parents uh, is is always, I think, as, as Emma has has intimated, uh, is to think very very carefully uh, when a child is is 16 before sending her or him to to university, and they would need to be very confident that the child is sufficiently mature uh, to to be in that sort of environment at that age. And I know, of course, each of the universities may have students who are 16, who are extremely mature, but it is a very, very important uh, thing for families to reflect upon. And I say that as a parent uh, of a teenage daughter as, as well as, as, as a, an experienced academic. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Some, a question here is for um, accommodation and it's asked, mm -hmm. Can deposits be made for meals? Um, who can answer that? It's free to all. Can deposits be made for meals? I know it has to be based on the accommodation contract signed, but I just need um, someone. Alicia, please, can you put, put your words? I can, well, I think, um, I don't know if it's the same. I imagine it would be very similar for some universities. They'll have catered or non-catered yeah. halls. So um, lots of universities now will have a, a card that students can preload maybe with some cash that they can use in the canteens if they're not in catered accommodation. If they're in catered, then the meal is usually included within the cost of the accommodation in general. So um, I think I'll um, you know, invite any colleagues if it's different for them to jump in and say, but that seems to be quite a standard way of doing things. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the same at Nottingham. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, let me see. Okay, this is for, this is a, a very valid qu question. I don't know if anyone has answered this. This is for the Nottingham rep. Is there any reduction in fees in the event that the teaching pro proceeds online until <clears throat> later in the year? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, th I think this is a question that every university has um, been facing and the reality is that there, there won't be a reduction in the tuition fees because what universities are seeing is that in fact in order to deliver the courses online there isn't a significant reduction in, in cost for the university. There's um, additional investment that is going into the digital um, tools um, staff are often having to also revisit the learning materials, the delivery channels. So um, I don't think um, we should expect um, reductions in fees. I think as as some people have said, you know, there are other scholarships and discount amounts that may be offered, but they wouldn't be tied to the delivery method that is being offered. Okay, thank you. Um, this question, maybe I'll channel it to Professor Peter. 
um, will it will it be possible? I know you offer nursing. Now, will it be possible for someone who has already gotten a conditional offer in another course, take for instance, um, health science, can they later move to nursing? Prof? Yeah, th th thank you very much. Um, I, th I think it, it very much depends on the, the course to which a person wishes to move. I know for nursing, there is an interview as part of the process. So I imagine that if the person, the applicant passed the interview, that should not be problematic. Um, but I would have to give an answer on a case by case um, basis. But generally, in terms of, of classroom based courses at Dundee, there is a, a relatively high degree of flexibility. Okay, thank you. So that's definitely something I can explore offline. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we will soon be rounding up because um, we've taken almost your time. But let me read another one. Would universities be accepting WIAC as a basis for admission into university courses? Um, I'm not sure because the university here would admit students after they've done either their foundation or their WIAC. Am I correct, Prof? Will you admit a student straight with no. wife? Not typically. So it depends. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So it, 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 for us, it, it's something we're reconsidering. It depends on the, the course for which a student wishes to enter. Um, Scottish universities have four year degree programs. Okay. So we're, we're considering now to admit directly students with WIAC into the first year of one of our four year degree programs. So but a student who has A-levels could come into year two of one of our four-year programs or for English law, for example, that the, the, the degree is only three years long. Okay. Alicia, you wanted to say something? Sorry, I jumped in then. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just to say that, you know, typically, obviously, the, the degree that's four years long, um, student would, would get that bridging um, link, whereas with a three-year degree, it, it's not typical that we'd take students in with a WIAC, they'd have to go into foundation. Um, and it's quite a critical year to actually try and do that. So I tend to say to students, um, depends on the circumstances, but if they have a, a strong foundation provision within their local region and if they're settled and things are going well, then we do suggest to them that's a lower risk than moving to a foreign country and, and undertaking foundation studies. Okay. Um, it just depends on the individual setup. But for why straight into degree, it would be a no for most British, but sorry, for most English universities. Yeah. I think you've spoken for both um, Nottingham and excess in that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um let me see let me see let me see um ielts results that are going to expire this year before admission begin will they still be considered for application even if a conditional offer is gotten for ielts results that are going to expire this year. How we wish to know when the result will be expired. Will it be expired in December or it's going to expire in June? Or so um, I don't know who would be able to talk about that because I know excess doesn't require IELTS, but in a situation where the student doesn't meet up C6 in WIAC or C in IUCSC, they need I. IELTS, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Something. in that case, yes. in that case, if they are to put IELTS results that would be expiring this year, do you think it would be considered for application? So, um, if, if we know that the standard validity of an IELTS certificate is two years, um, if your IELTS was taken in October of 2018, and it's still valid at the time that you are processing your visa and you're arriving and you're registering, then it would still be accepted. If it was taken in June of 2018, um, 
I think it would be a question of contacting the university that you have an offer with to find out whether they are extending that validity in full knowledge of the fact that many IELTS testing centers have been closed over the last few months. Um, I know that we have a number of courses that are starting in January instead of in September for our master's program. So for those students, we're not expecting them to sit a new test you know, that would be valid for the January start. We will extend the, valid the validity of any um, certificates that they have that would have normally been sufficient for, um, for the September start date. So I think that's something to check with each individual university just to see what flexibility they have around that. And I think, as we mentioned earlier, um, it may be that there are alternatives that um, can be presented instead of the IELTS as well, without that necessarily being the automatic kind of go-to, especially at this moment in time. There, there are many universities accepting a much wider range of proof of English language than we would normally see. Okay, so I think for any IELTS alternatives, they can actually contact the universities and uh, to know what alternatives can be put in place. Okay, as a final note, I would appreciate um, yes. um, everyone here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking your time to speak with our students and parents. Um, please, I would like you to share your slide to show your details. So, um, they can actually, let me just put this in an order. So, Professor, please share your slide to show your details for them to contact you if they need to. Absolutely. Very happy to share my slides. Okay. You, you, you want to share them right now? Okay. Uh, sure. your, your address, your email address, just to see. Yep. So while we wait for Prof, Mr. Rinze, you would also put in your details for them to see. Um, there we go, let's be shared. Okay, thank you. So after Mr. Arinze, Emma would share. So thank you, Prof, you could close your share so that Mr. Arinze can share his. So after Mr. Um, Arinze. Again, mine is Mine is simple, is um, arinze at sx.ac. Okay, you can I'm message the to... I hope it's... Um, you can. I wanted to just send it to the chat group if you okay, allow let me, me. Let me Let me permit you to do that. You can do that now. So, Emma, right. please, can you... Um, um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's Thank it, you. but Thank I'll still you. put it on there. So I'll stop now. Thank you. And then Thank share you. it on the chat group. Emma, please, can you do yeah. the share so we can have everyone back to you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, your turn, please. Okay. Yep. Thank you, everyone, once again. It's a pleasure to have you. And um, thanks for being our participants as well, for our parents, our students, and our prospective students. We are welcome to yeah, have I think you. I'm next to pull yeah, down. That's fine. That's fine, Mr. Rinze. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Elsie, can you share your screen so that we can for Bridge House students, for, for contact to Bridge House, can you just share the screen for you? Elsie? Okay. Okay, so if you want to contact Bridge House Counseling, our email will be sent to you via chat, so you can also get across to us for your admissions inquiries, um, for your inquiries to any other university, we will be able to put you through. Subsequently, we'll be having other webinars for 
our partner universities who will be on board to speak with you. We like to appreciate everyone again. Thank you so much. So I will be ending the meeting. For any other information, please feel free to send us a chat. And um, okay, someone said they didn't get Mr. Rinze's email. Please, Mr. Rinze, can you quickly share your slide? Can you share your details? Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Let me, let me, let me, let me send it through, through chat. It's okay, it's okay. I know you're running out of time here. All right. Yeah. So I'm putting. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yes. I'm putting it on chat. That's fine. So thank you. Just Arinza, like I said, Arinza at sx. Dot yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure having you. And uh, we hope to organize this and um, subsequent webinars for our parents and offer holders for necessary conversion to their various universities and to actually have a direct interface with um, university representatives to get straight from, their, from them. So thank you and I wish you all a very wonderful weekend and enjoy your day. Stay safe. Social Thanks. distancing. Bye. Thank, Thank you, so you for much. having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You're Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Very much. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye, ma. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. 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 Hello, sir. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay.